ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, may I have your attention, please? Uh, my name is Jan Sitonen, and it's me who has been sending all those emails to you. Uh, and I'm hosting this event today. Uh, I'm very pleased that so many people have arrived here and uh, we are able to have this discussion today. Uh, as you know, New York voted on Tuesday and I'm sure you're familiar with the results. But for further analysis, we're gonna, I'm pleased to introduce you uh, Fulbright Professor Lane Brothers, who is going to give his analysis today. Uh, after his presentation, we're going to hear uh, Matthew Wood's comments on his presentation. Uh, he's from AmCham, American Chamber of Commerce. And the moderator for today is Anna Abrahamsson from uh, Swedish Youth. We're going to finish this briefing about 12.30 in about one hour. And uh, without further ado, may I present you Professor Lane Crothers, welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, it is very good to be here today. I, I always get lost when I come to this part of Helsinki, so I'm glad to keep that record going. Um, so when I first got this email, part of me asked, why the heck are you calling me? We're all wrong. Right? The one universal fact about this election is that everybody who looks like me has been wrong from the beginning of the Donald Trump campaign on. There's a whole, and we're going to talk a bit about why that's the case here in just a second, but I start from that as a bracket because the logical conclusion is everything I tell you at the end is also wrong. <laughs> right? I make no promises here because this is an odd year. Right? It is an odd year. It's odd for no other reason that you guys now know more about the details of American presidential elections than you ever expected to. Right? And that speaks to the kind of strangeness of this experience. And I thought rather than, I, I'm not a journalist, frankly political scientists don't believe that the day-to-day -day things that happen in campaigns matter, matter very much. And there's a very simple reason. Almost everybody who's a Democrat has already made up their mind who they're voting for in November. It makes no difference at all what happens in the campaign. Almost all of them are going to vote for the Democrat. And almost everybody who's a Republican in the United States has already made up their mind who they're voting for in November. They're going to vote for the Republican. So the daily kind of twists and turns and oh my God, they said this and they said this. It's all nonsense to a political scientist. It doesn't mean that Hillary Clinton can't be caught on the street taking a bribe while shooting someone in the face. Although, to be fair, Dick Cheney shot someone in the face and that didn't bother people. But beyond that, we're really talking about in the day-to-day -day issues of campaigns, you're talking about the margins, you're talking about the few people who honestly haven't made up their mind and most of them are lying when they say they haven't. But what I thought I'd start talking about really, in fact, is that why people like me have struggled so much in this election, why people like me have, in fact, had a hard time getting it. And the first thing I want to talk about is that the campaigns in America tend to have certain kind of set patterns. At least in the modern era, by which I mean elections after 1968, and we changed the rules after 1968, so it's a different era, there, are, there tend to be certain patterns. So for example, if you look at who wins a, a presidential nomination by ideology, you're going to discover <coughs> Sorry, that in almost all cases that the Democratic nominee is moderately liberal and the Republican nominee is moderately conservative, at least in American understandings of those terms, which means somewhere between average and troglodyte here in Finland, right? But so what? We're talking in American terms. We're not talking about European terms. They just tend to be. Why? It has to do with the nature of the constituencies that show up in primaries and caucuses. Republican caucuses and primaries are made up of highly conservative, highly ideological voters. Democratic primaries are made up of highly liberal, highly ideological voters. Amazingly enough, they tend to people, pick people who fit their profile. And then come the general election, you get a broader profile of people. We'll get to that in a little bit. Secondly, if you look at the experience of presidential candidates, I, I, I'm sorry, sorry to take a step away from there. That Democratic profile still fits with Hillary Clinton. It's why Bernie Sanders, sorry guys, he's not going to win. 
I know he's an average politician in Finland. He's a radical in America. He's way over here. The voters are way over here. Hillary Clinton's two and a half million votes ahead. That's a pretty typical American election. Donald Trump, it's worth pointing out, doesn't fit that profile. He's a, he's a disruptive force. It will, he's not a natural Republican. He's not actually a conservative. There's a lot of stuff going on there. We'll get to him. So that's part of the reason we've struggled. Another of the reasons we've struggled is if you look at the nature of the experience of American politicians, we have, like most societies, decided that you should hire politicians to do politics. Right? You hire doctors to do doctors, you hire electricians to do electricity, you hire plumbers to do plumbing, you hire politicians to do politics. And most of our recent elections, we've hired ex-governors and ex-vice presidents. As exceptions, Barack Obama was a senator in 2016. It looks like Hillary Clinton will most likely win the election, and she's, of course, a senator. That may be changing. But historically, we've hired ex-vice ex presidents and ex-governors. Donald Trump, of course, is just a straight businessman. The only straight businessman the United States has ever elected, the only person with no previous electoral experience ever who made his entire career in business was Herbert Hoover, who, had he not been president of the United States, would be recognized as one of the greatest Americans in history. Ran the relief operations in Europe after World War I, Secretary of Commerce, President of Stanford University, and oh yeah, the guy who led us into the Great Depression. Right? and responded like a businessman, not like a politician. <laughs> Herbert Hoover, nobody's a big fan. So there's that. And also the Republicans in particular have a tendency, it's not always this case, but they have a tendency to nominate the last number two candidate if that number two candidate was credible. And I'll define credible here in a second. Think about it. 2000, who came in second? John McCain. John McCain's the nominee in 2008. 2008, who comes in second? Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney's the nominee in 2012. The Republicans in particular have a tendency to do this. What do I mean by kind of reasonable? Well, they did well in the previous cycle of elections. They get a lot of endorsements from party leadership. They tend to be moderate conservatives, as we discussed. Um, and they tend to have really good organization structures. And it turns out that American presidential elections are almost entirely disconnected from the job of president. That is, the job of getting elected president and the job of president are almost completely disconnected. But the one area they are connected is that to run a modern presidential election, you have to have an immense organization that's incredibly well put together. And that skill, at least we hope, translates into the presidency. It doesn't always, but you have to hope. Well, of course, now, now 2016 was always going to be a bit more open because there, the 2012 person who came in second was an ex-senator named Rick Santorum. And Rick Santorum is a whack job. <laughs> he just is. He's a hyper-conservative guy who's argued that if you have gay marriage, the next thing you have is you're going to have to legalize his man-on-dog sex. I'm not making that up. <laughs> All right. Um, and so he was never going to be a credible candidate. He was always going to be a bit more open. So we weren't really ready, I guess is what I'm trying to get at, for a Donald Trump. And then Donald Trump enters, and he is, in fact, a deeply disruptive character in a way that modern American campaign and candidates aren't usually. Um, he is, of course, it's worth pointing out, a media star. He knew how to manipulate the media. He was willing to say whatever he had to say to get into the media. In fact, for all of his wealth, Donald Trump has spent much less on his campaign than anybody else has. Why? He doesn't have to. He gets all the media attention he can stand. Why does he get all the media attention to stand? We have a for-profit media. What drives a for-profit media? Do you get ratings? Do you get hits on your website? Anything Donald Trump says, he gets large numbers of hits. He drives business. He drives traffic. So the media, of course, ciphers Donald Trump to the extent he wants. When you look at the studies of media coverage in this election, and particularly if you're a Bernie Sanders fan, there's big conspiracy theories running about out there. Oh my God, Bernie Sanders is being dissed. And blah, blah, blah. That's just all crap. The big beneficiary of the media this cycle has been Donald Trump. His voice, his name gets out there, he drives attention to his campaign, and he drives attention away from other campaigns as a consequence in a way that was unexpected when he first came in. Um, it's worth pointing out that he's also done a good job of driving away uh, kind of the quiet opposition. One of the forces out there that, that we've worried about in American politics since 2010 is the Supreme Court ruling called Citizens United. Have you heard of Citizens United? Citizens United 
is a ruling which is a, a, a ruling of a, a long-standing string of rulings. So it rests on a whole host of Supreme Court precedents going back to the 1970s that argues that money is speech. And that if you limit someone's right to spend money in a campaign, you're limiting their right for just free free. It's a dumb ruling, but it, the ruling from 1976 called Buckley versus Vallejo and Citizens United is kind of the culmination of that. So now you have situations where billionaires are literally pumping hundreds of millions of dollars into campaigns. And the fear has been that those billionaires are going to be buying candidates and buying elections. Since 2010, it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. Whether it's because Barack Obama, for example, in 2012, personally raised almost $2 billion for his campaign, and therefore was able to counter some of that money, or it's because the billionaires have backed whack jobs like Rick Santorum, that money can't buy votes. It hasn't really mattered. Well, in this campaign, one of the, one of the hopes has been, if you're a Republican, mainstream Republican, is that, that you're going to get the billionaires to come in and spend a lot of money to support a not Donald Trump candidate. There's also not Ted Cruz, because he's a slam bag, hateful piece of crap, too. <laughs> not that I have an opinion in the matter. Um, all I can tell you about Ted Cruz is the only reason anybody in the Republican establishment is even thinking about supporting him is because he's not Donald Trump. They hate the man. Um, well, now if you're one of these billionaires, the problem is, is that you've, you've been used to giving this money in private, you've been used to giving this money in secret, you've been used to be able to give this money and have influence, and then walk away. Donald Trump doesn't care. He'll call your 14-year-old daughter ugly. He'll mock you for the way that your wife looks. This is the billionaire, right? He will attack you on a personal level and, entreat, and, and bring you into the campaign in a way that no other candidate has ever been willing to do because, of course, if you're Ted Cruz or you're Barack Obama, you need their money. You can't attack them. Trump doesn't give a crap. So he's been deeply disruptive in ways that the system has not really been prepared for. Finally, and, 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 and I, I want to emphasize this a little bit, people like me um, missed something inside the Republican Party and or, or not, they didn't necessarily miss it but they undervalued it. Like all American political parties, our political parties are made up of coalitions of people, right? You have individual parties that are relatively ideologic, ideologically coherent. We don't. We have mega parties that have coalitions within them, right? So the Republican Party is disproportionately made up of business people, Christian evangelicals, and a population of people who used to vote Democrat but don't anymore. White Southerners, working class, small business people, and white Northerners who used to be union members. I say used to be union members because unions are dead. Been pretty effectively killed over the last 30 years. That, that third population has voted for the Republican Party over the years on the promise that a couple of things would happen. They voted on the Republican Party for the Republican Party on the promise that the Republican Party would re-stimulate the economy for people like them, largely through tax cuts to the rich, right? Trickle-down economics. You stimulate the rich, the rich spend money, it helps us all out, boom. And also they voted for the Republican Party on the grounds that the Republican Party would stop giving them our money. And by them, of course, I mean black people. And by our money, I mean white people who work. It's racist as crap. But it's code racism, right? It's indirect racism. It's not direct racism. But the statement is that welfare, Obamacare, all these things are Democrats giving your hard-working money away to black people. And before you guys get too smug, you've got 30,000 migrants in this country and you're freaking out. My country's almost majority minority. Wait until you are and see how the politics grow. Because the world's walking and they're coming whether you want them to or not. Finland ain't going to look like this. Certainly not at a 1.6 replacement rate, which I saw is your birth rate right now. It's not going to be white, amazingly white, forever. What that, what, what, what's really happened in this election and what Donald Trump has exploited is he's exploited the fact that the Republican Party has never actually done those things. It's never actually passed policies that would help the white working class and white small business people. 
It's never actually gotten rid of Obamacare or welfare or abortion rights. It's never done those things. And Donald Trump has pulled the green curtain back and say, see, they've been lying to you guys. They've been screwing you. Come with me. And what does he say? We'll win. Finally, we'll win. We'll win on the trade deals and we'll win on the policy deals and you're gonna, we're going to win so much, you're going to, he says this, we're going to win so much, you're going to get tired of winning. But we don't care, we're going to keep on winning. Because the elites, right, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party establishment, they've been screwing you over for 40 years. By the way, it's not wrong. They have been. What Paul Krugman put this very nicely, he said that if you think about what the Republican Party actually does, what it actually does is mobilize white resentment, right, about policies aimed at the poor and policies aimed at minorities. It mobilizes white resentment, but what it does is deliver tax cuts to rich people. And that gap has finally this year found a, an articulator in Donald Trump. So in fact, what's going on is Donald Trump supporters are um, running a coup inside the Republican Party. They are take, trying to take the party from within, as is their right, and is as possible with the nature of primaries and caucuses, and we'll get back to that in a second. Okay. So I think that's been some of the big reasons why people like me got it wrong, none of which changes the fact of why we got here. We got here. We're here. right? And so what's going to happen going forward? What, what matters? Again, as I say, in my opinion, the day-to-day -day kind of, uh, oh my God, he said, she said stuff that tends to dominate the news, don't pay very much attention to this. What matters is delegates. It's the only thing that matters. Does Trump get to 1237? Hillary Clinton's probably going to win her nomination. Hillary Clinton's probably going to get there. There's a chance she won't, but she probably will. Trump is marginal. And what really matters is the delegate yield rate. Isn't that an exciting concept? The delegate yield rate. What does that mean? It means that if I win a primary and I win 48% of the vote, it doesn't follow that I get 48% of the delegates. And the Republican Party, in some cases, they're winner take all. If I get more votes than anybody else, I can get all those delegates. On the other hand, in some cases, they're more proportional. Except that, and this is where Donald Trump has proved to be quite weak and where Ted Cruz has proved to be much smarter as a professional politician. Actually selecting delegates who will actually go to the convention is, like everything else in an American presidential election, ridiculously hard and complicated. So you have the silly idea that if Donald Trump wins New York, his delegates go to the convention. That's just dumb. I mean, it makes sense. Therefore, it's dumb. <laughs> Almost everything about American politics can be explained that if it makes sense, we don't do it. <laughs> and if it doesn't make sense, we do it. What do I mean by this? Well, I'll pick on Illinois. I, I live in Illinois. I'll pick on Illinois for a second. So let's just say for the sake of argument that Illinois has assigned 100 delegates to the Republican convention. You run an election. Somebody wins the Illinois primary. Awesome. Somebody wins the Illinois primary. So what? It turns out that we actually allocate those delegates by our 18 congressional districts. So you take those 100 delegates and they get divided up into the 18 congressional districts. If you're a candidate now in Illinois, you and say, I live in the, I live in the 13th district, um, and let's say the 13th district gets eight, not eight candidates, it gets eight delegates. If you're Donald Trump, you have to go find eight people in the 13th district to get on the ballot to run to go to the, Demo to go to the Republican Party convention. And you have to find them months before the election because you have to go through the process of getting them on the ballot, which of course in America is hard. But it's much easier in Illinois than it is in New York. In New York and my, many other states, they had their election. Donald Trump wins. Hillary Clinton wins. Awesome. Means almost nothing. Pennsylvania, in fact, means essentially nothing. Because in two weeks, they're going to have, at the county level, they're going to start having conventions. Those conventions are made up of party leaders. And those party leaders at the county level are going to elect people to go to a meeting at the state level. And at the state level, they're going to pick the people who actually go to the delegates six weeks from now. Well, on the first ballot at a convention, they are probably bound, under, depends on the state law, at the first ballot of the convention, they're probably bound to vote for the person they're pledged to vote for. So, but on the second ballot, almost all of them are probably going to be Ted Cruz supporters. Because what's happened is Donald Trump hasn't gone out 
and worked with the parties to get his people to go to the convention in two weeks, that go to the state convention in six weeks, to then elect Donald Trump supporters to the convention, he's ignored that part of the process. Ted Cruz, to his credit, Barack Obama in 2008, to his credit, has paid attention to that part of the process. And so enormous number of delegates going to the Democratic, to the Republican convention in 2016, um, this year in Cleveland of all God for second places, why the Republicans are going to Cleveland, I don't know, um, are in fact going to, they'll vote for Ted Cruz on one ballot, or sorry, Donald Trump on one ballot, but they actually want Ted Cruz to be the nominee. So it's the delegate yield rate that's really going to matter. Um, likewise, every so often you hear a, a discussion about um, the, uh, uh, is there going to be a white knight? Is there going to be a third candidate emerge at the convention? Are we going to get a new con candidate at the convention who isn't Donald Trump and isn't Ted Cruz to come try to save the Republican Party? Currently, that's not legal under the rules as the party has passed. The party has something called Rule 40. Rule 40 says that only people who've gotten a majority of votes in at least eight states can be placed, have their names placed, placed in the nomination. There are two candidates who meet that criteria. Now you're saying, great, can't they change that rule? Of course they can, except that most of the delegates of the convention are going to be for Trump or Cruz, so why would they? Right? Because if Trump loses on the first ballot, Rule 40 means the only available remaining candidate is Cruz, so why would Cruz vote for it? So, in the background, what's really interesting to me anyway is if the, if the Republican Party tries to change Rule 40 before the convention, what the Republican Party is doing is basically, um, in an American football analogy, they're punting. The Republican Party leadership has decided the 2016 election is over. They're going to lose. I'll get to why in just a minute. They've decided that. What they're worried about now is the Senate. What they're worried about now is the House, and nobody was worried about the House six months ago. Nobody thought the Democrats could take back the House six months ago, and now they're talking about taking back the House. They're worried about governorships and state legislatorships. They're looking at a wipeout of epic proportions. Why? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. It has to do with the nature of, of Trump first and even Cruz. So these are the kind of questions, it seems to me, in the next few weeks as the elections go forward. Um, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are likely to win the next several sets of elections. Does Donald Trump in particular yield enough candidates to um, get to the 1237 number he has to get to or not? If he does, can't be stopped. If he doesn't, there's going to be a whole lot of effort out there in the background to try to at least save the down ticket races because at the top, the game seems over. This is also why Bernie Sanders isn't going to win. Hillary Clinton needs about 53 or 54 percent of the delegates in the remaining caucuses and primaries, almost all of which she's leading by more than that percentage in. Bernie Sanders needs like 70 percent of the delegates in the remaining states. It's just not going to happen. 74-year-old Jewish men from Vermont do not become president of the United States. The three or four electoral college votes you get for New York, for Vermont, just ain't all that important. So let's talk briefly about the, the general election is just kind of a, what, why I keep saying I think Hillary's going to win, why I think they're looking at epic wipeouts. Um, it is worth remembering that Donald Trump is not actually a Republican. Until very recently, he was a registered Democrat. Until very recently, he, called, he was a, a pro-choice on the question of abortion rights. Until very recently, he was calling for single-payer national health care. Donald Trump is not a Republican. Donald Trump is a Donald Trump. <laughs> right. And the Republicans don't like him for that. They don't like him for the fact that he's pulled back the green curtain, that he's shaken this coalition um, in a way that may not be unshaken for a long time to come. It's also true that presidents of the United States are not elected by the popular vote, and it wouldn't matter if they were in this case, but they are elected by the Electoral College, right? As President Al Gore taught us, you can win the majority or a majority of the popular vote in the United States and still not be president of the United States. Al Gore won that election by half a million votes. President Bush didn't give a crap. Right? If, just on simple math here, if you look at the states in the United States that have voted Democrat in the last six consecutive elections, so that's from 1992, the election of Bill Clinton, 
through 2012, the re-election of Barack Obama. Just the states that have voted Democrat, they control 242 electoral college votes in the United States. It takes 270 to win. What that means is assuming all those states vote Democrat, and they don't have to, right? It's not a law. But if they all vote Democrat again, all the Democrat has to do to become president is win Florida. That's it. You win Florida, you're president. Bang. If you take the same logic and go at the six states, or sorry, at, at the, 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 the states that voted Republican six elections in a row, it's 102 electoral college votes. It's Texas and all the empty places. Some southern states and all the empty places. Right? Nobody lives in Wyoming. I'm not kidding about this. <laughs> Nobody lives in Wyoming. Fewer people live in Wyoming than live in the city I live in, which is Bloomington Normal, Peoria, and Springfield, Illinois combined. Understand that Chicago is twice as populous as Finland, right? So, you know, we're talking about nobody lives in Wyoming. Germany and Montana are the same size. Germany has 80 million people. Montana has 800,000 people. It's among the many reasons that Germany has better mass transit than Montana. <laughs> this, what you have to tell me in order to make me think that Donald Trump is going to win, or Ted Cruz for that matter, because this math applies to him too, is what states he peels away from the Democrat. The guy who alienates women, minorities. What states does he peel away from the Democrat? What swing states does he mobilize in front of what's a typical voting coalition come the fall, right? To, which is much bigger than what's now in the primary elections. Very small fractions of Americans vote in primary elections. Donald Trump is winning 35 to 50 percent of tiny fractions of voters. If it's a primary election, on average in the United States, about 25% of the eligible voters will come and vote in a primary election. If it's a caucus election, in an average year, 8%. So Donald Trump is winning 35 to 50% of 8%. So is Bernie Sanders, which is why he's not winning. Bernie Sanders wins caucuses when tiny fractions of people show up. Put it in a slightly different way, 200,000 people voted in the Nevada caucuses this year. 1.2 million people voted in the Nevada elections in 2012. So if you look at the constituencies of people who tended to show up and vote in the general election, they're much more minority, they're much more female, they're much more working class than the populations that tend to show up and vote in primaries. You have to show me how Donald Trump or Ted Cruz captures those people. And I don't think you can do it. There is one path, and this is the one kind of meta question out there that we, that we struggle with in the United States, and that, of course, is voter suppression. If, in fact, the voter ID law work as the Republicans tend them to work, if, in fact, the uh, reduction in polling places work the way the Republicans intend them to work, that could be a problem. So far, they haven't. So far, the courts have backed up efforts when they've said that that shouldn't be done. But what they're trying to do by that is change the demographics. What they're trying to do is take minorities in particular out of the electorate so that the electorate becomes about white people and white men. If it's white men, Republicans win. If it's a regular American election, Republicans get wiped out. And in the United States, unfortunately, that decision is left at the state level. That operation is left at the state level. It's not a subject to federal review. So in any case, let me just finish by saying that um, I have spent the last several years observing American politics, being quite frustrated by the stasis and frozenness of our politics, by the, the fact that because of the American constitutional system, there are millions of veto points and millions of checkpoints and millions of places where the system can be frozen. And when you have a Senate, as we've had for the last several uh, years, which has decided that everything has to pass with a 60 vote majority, not a 51 vote majority, the system has just seized up. And so as a consequence, I've said to myself, you know, maybe it's time to give up. Maybe it's time to say that a system designed in 1787 when the United States was a marginal country trying to protect slavery is not gonna work for the world's only hyperpower that's the linchpin of global politics, global international affairs, and global economics. Maybe they're just not compatible. And therefore, more of a parliamentary system makes sense. This particular election has made me fall back in love with James Madison. 
the system of checks and balances and the electoral college suddenly seem like really damn good ideas to me. <laughs> now partially this is because my team's going to win, almost certainly. But in any case, um, if you think about these things in the big picture sorts of ways, hopefully it'll give you a way to understand what's going on uh, that's outside kind of the daily reportage of American elections. It's a little less crazy and a little more coherent than it sounds, but only a little bit. <laughs> And with that, I'm happy to step aside. So thank you. All right. Thank you for that um, insightful and thought-provoking analysis. Um, next up, we're going to have Matthew Wood from the American Chamber of Commerce giving your comments to this. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I don't think I probably need this so much. Just, can everyone hear me back there pretty well? Okay, good. Just checking. Um, yes, sir. All right. So, first of all, uh, to introduce myself, I am a Canadian working for the American Chamber of Commerce in Finland, so take from that what you may. Uh, the thing that I was first reminded of uh, that strikes me very strongly uh, listening to this is, wow, what a crazy system you have. That is, that is I, I forget about it sometimes, but that is, Extremely complicated. <laughs> no, I'm not blaming you, but uh, I know Canada's not perfect, but uh, we have Justin Trudeau, so, so there. <laughs> we can do no wrong these days, which is quite nice. Uh, it's a good change for us. Uh, we've had a very interesting history as a neighbor of uh, the United States, as Canadians. Uh, if you ever want a good read, I suggest uh, looking up the concept of manifest destiny, the idea that America was destined to take over the entire North American continent, some mission from God type uh, thing. We tried, we tried. And yes, and we're very proud for uh, not having been invaded since 1812. So we're hoping that we can continue that streak, uh, <laughs> keep that alive. Uh, it turned out okay for everyone in the end. Um, we're a little concerned, I think, about uh, Donald Trump in particular. Almost everyone else probably is not that extreme. He's talked about tearing up NAFTA, the trade agreement between Canada, the US, and Mexico, if he can't renegotiate it. Uh, seemingly unilaterally, so it could be pretty complicated times for us, but I don't expect that to uh, really happen unless everything goes to hell. Um, just quickly about Ted Cruz, because I think you didn't spend enough time on how weird of a guy Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz is. Uh, he is the most hated man in Congress by far. Uh, one, a very, very well-respected uh, Senator, Lindsey Graham, who's typically a relatively moderate guy in the Republican caucus, um, he said at an event that if someone came into the Senate floor and shot Ted Cruz with a gun, he wouldn't be convicted. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he later went on to endorse, uh, to endorse Donald Trump, unsurprisingly, but these things happen. Um, if you ever want a fun read, I suggest you look up uh, Ted Cruz's college roommate on Twitter. He, uh, he tends to tweet about uh, what an asshole <laughs> Ted Cruz was in his college years, and he really, really hates this guy. He's a writer on a lot of different programs, and he actually just dedicates his life now to, <laughs> to trying to destroy Ted Cruz, which is a really good laugh. Um, slightly more seriously, um, what's next? You have a couple of big uh, primary days coming up. April 26th, you have Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Maryland are the big states up for grabs. And then on June 7th, you have California and New Jersey. Those are the big prizes available still. Um, you have Trump leading by a wide margin all throughout the Northeast in all of the remaining states, more or less, on the Republican side. And Clinton should probably be able to wrap it up on the Democratic side. So it seems like uh, that's going to be the question of uh, 1237 on the Republican side, like Professor Carruthers said. Um, Clinton seems to have it uh, relatively easily now. Um, so I'm hoping for a contested convention, which seems like what's going to happen, just because I, I enjoy watching good television. And uh, I, I sort of hope that John Kasich might come out of this, uh, since it takes away the possibility of something crazy happening, like Hillary Clinton getting caught stabbing someone or something wild, and then giving it to Donald Trump. So that could be uh, reducing the possibility of terrible things happening. But uh, overall, let's watch the fireworks, and hopefully it'll be fun for the rest of the way. And with that, I'll shut up, and hopefully we can get to the panel. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, then we have some time for questions. I think we have roughly almost half an hour. So are there any thoughts on the floor so far? 
Yes. You can uh, present yourself as well. No? Does it work? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, assumed that um, by gerrymandering and voter suppression and the help of the media, the Republicans would win the presidency. Uh, there has been so much talk about Donald Trump. Would anybody prefer Ted Cruz? Uh, actually, I would. Uh, okay, I mean, he is a person who has outed himself as a beater of small children. Uh, he is declaring himself to be Barack first. Obama, Barack Obama has murdered U.S. citizens overseas without yeah. recourse to law. It's that when, when you get into that kind of discussion, Barack Obama has murdered U.S. citizens overseas. Uh, U.S. citizens overseas without due process. And, uh, yeah, but uh, he also considers himself, first of all, a Christian, only after that an American, and so on downwards. Look, look. So, and then uh, he recommends as a way to find the Islamic State carpet bombing. So uh, I think he is a deeply, deeply, deeply neurotic person. Well, but first of all, I totally agree with you. He's a complete asshole. <laughs> He's a vile, disgusting human being, and I can't believe the, universe, the, the, the state of Texas elected him, and I can't believe that he's gotten to this point in time in the campaign. What, but that wasn't your question. We are where we are. Why would I prefer Ted Cruz to Donald Trump? And, and first of all, this is a giant bracket. Neither one of the, the, the chance, the non-zero chances of these guys being elected are so low Understand that Donald Trump, 63% of the American population hates Donald Trump. He's got the biggest negatives of any modern presidential candidate ever. The only person who's competitive with him on negatives is Ted Cruz. They are both going to make Hillary Clinton popular and nobody likes her either. <laughs> so you, you set up an intense hypothetical, right? and then quite properly identified the many disgusting and vile things about Ted Cruz. Here's why I prefer him. My wife, by the way, entirely agrees with you. <laughs> it's simply this. Ted Cruz, as a professional politician, actually needs the political system to exist. His identity and his career rests on the functioning of the American political system. Mm -hmm. He is not the one saying, everybody's been ripping you off, the system needs to come down. Donald Trump is the one who acts like he doesn't need the system and think he can, buy his, he, he can buy his way through it as an individual entrepreneur and, a, um, and, and as someone who uh, can just uh, get what he wants through donations and whatever else. Donald Trump has no investment in the survival of the American political system. For all of its flaws, I do have an investment in the survival of the American political system, and it seems to me that Ted Cruz is less fundamentally threatening to it than the system is. This is then where we need to remember that presidents of the United States are actually not that powerful. They have a lot of power in foreign policy. They do, and there's a lot of dumb things they can do, and there's a lot of stupid ways they can do it, but when it gets to actually passing legislation and actually passing budgets, Congress matters, and Congress hates both Cruz and you're exactly right about the, 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 the Lindsey Graham quote, um, and they hate Ted, Donald Trump too. So he can come forward with all the agendas he wants in the world, and none of them are gonna happen, even in front of a Republican Congress, and the circumstances of him being elected, it's just the mind boggles, right? So that's, that's where I'm coming from. In a highly abstract environment, I prefer Ted Cruz. In reality, you're gonna get Hillary Clinton, like her or not. <coughs> there are some more uh, questions on the floor. Maybe we can start uh, there in the back and then go up here. Thanks. Um, my name is Nico Purhenen. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Swedish School of Social Science. And uh, I've been very interested in, in studying right-wing populism recently. And um, I was thinking about the third electorate, the third GOP electorate you mentioned, uh, the Northern Union members and, uh, and disillusioned white, white Southerners who, who 
um, abandoned the Democrats. So what happens to these people? Uh, what will they do when, when they find out that Trump is not going to get elected as president uh, and not necessarily even as a Republican nominee? What do these people do? Does this somehow like disarm their potential or does it electrify them or can, can you, do you have any insight on this? You know, it, it's a great question because it, it, it's exactly what, first of all, the Republican Party leadership is scared silly of. What they're scared silly of is watching the Republican coalition shatter and not be able to be put together very smoothly or very easily for a long time. Um, there are Republicans who have now finally woken up and said, you know, gosh darn it, the way you keep that coalition together is to actually serve that constituency for once. That instead of only delivering tax cuts to rich people, you now actually need to pass policies that recognize that free trade is not always beneficial to large segments of population. And if you're going to displace a segment of the population through free trade agreements, you need to give them opportunities to get out. It's not just job training. Uh, you can think about when all the factories closed down in Michigan. Great, you can job retrain all those people as much as you want, but they still own houses. And they still own houses that used to be worth $150,000 and are now worth $75,000 and they can't sell them to anybody anyway, so they're really worth zero, particularly now with Flint's water system. So you've trapped them physically even if you've retrained them factually. That's, you've got to figure out a way to make that happen. If you want those people to go get a job in Arizona, you've got to make it possible for them to go get a job in Arizona. So that's one possibility of a path where the Republican Party wakes up. They, that, that, that constituency seems to be racist enough that they're unwilling to come back to the Democrats. And so then the question is, you've got something like the Tea Party, which has been a much longer sustained force than a lot of people expected it to be in American politics. And could you start to see a, a growing challenge to the Republican Party in this way? That's what historically American political parties have done, at least since the rise of the Republican Party in 1854, as as constituencies rise that challenge a party's base, one or the other party adapts and brings them in. Right? What happened, of course, in 1854 was that the Whig Party couldn't adapt to slavery. And you've got the Republican Party, which was an anti-slave party, emerged. Since that time, the party's been flexible enough. Is this Republican Party flexible enough? I don't know. They do seem to have been trapped by the myth of Reagan. And, and I mean the myth of Ronald Reagan. The, 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 the version of Ronald Reagan's politics that this Republican Party believes in is not what Ronald Reagan did. But they've become trapped by that ideology. They've dealt with the Fox Newses and the right-wing radio commentators that fuel that and reinforce that and seem to rigidify it. And so there's an old quote that, uh, uh, that's come out in, in, in the context of, of the Constitution, but the quote is, the Constitution is not a suicide pact, right? That if during wartime you have to nudge and wink and ignore parts of the Constitution, well, you get to do that because it's a war. And at its worst, it sends the Japanese to the internment camps. And it's best it allows for German spies to be arrested while they're trying to leak convoy information, right? I mean, it... <laughs> The same is true for political parties, right? Ideologies are not suicide pacts. Right now, this Republican Party seems to act like it is, right? They're, they're, they're playing circular firing squads. Let's all get around each other in a giant circle and shoot. Gosh darn it. This is Heisenberg time right now. We're, we're in the middle of it, so we don't know where we're going, and we're not exactly sure where we are, but it's darned interesting. My name is Laura Norella. I'm from uh, Suomi America Yhdistysten Liitto, League of Finnish American Societies. I would like to hear your opinion on the importance of Hillary Clinton's emails. Uh, absolutely irrelevant. Couldn't be less relevant if you were beaten in the head with an axe. And I, and I tell you why. This is, these kinds of stories are exactly the stories that the political press loves. They're glorious process stories. You can talk about the details of this, that, and the other thing. Nobody in the actual world gives a damn about the minor details of small pieces, of tiny fractions of things, and how they did or didn't play out. Um, they, they simply don't shape in any way outcomes for people. And, and a bigger version of this I can give you, because think, I mean, the, the email debate, you have, you have no lot for that to actually kind of trigger. But when Barack Obama came out to announce that Osama bin Laden was dead, and for those of us who watched that live, um, 
I mean, the man came down the wing to the East Room of the White House with a swagger like you couldn't believe. That man came down that hall like, yeah, I am the baddest MF in the universe. <laughs> and lots of commentators like, that's it, 2012's election over, Barack Obama's going to win. Come 2012, nobody cared. It was two years ago. So Benghazi, you're going to hear about it, the emails, they're all small ball inside politics. They're like people who are really into baseball and they care about each little statistic when most of us read the scores at the end of the day and we walk away. So I just, I don't see them as a big deal. What if she gets invited? She's not going to. I mean, she's just not. Um, and she's already been cleared by about 14 different agencies. Yeah, okay, again, if she shoots somebody in the street while peeing on someone's dog, I don't know, sure. But Hillary Clinton, you gotta understand, this person has faced 25 years of non-stop attack on her character. Now you can believe that's because her character is slime. They might be, I've never met the woman. I met Barack Obama, he was a very energetic and charismatic guy, but, but I've never met the Clintons. I've been about two feet away from Bill Clinton. He's also a very charismatic guy, but, but um, I've never met Hillary Clinton. So she might be a complete scuzzbag. Whether she's a complete scuzzbag or not, the woman knows how to fight back. I mean, she's got 25 years of practice at it, so I'm not real worried about it. Thank you very much. My name is Ant Korsman, and I'm from the Finnish Foreign Ministry Policy Planning Unit. Maybe because of that, I should start by saying that nothing that I say <coughs> will in any way <laughs> bind the Finnish government. Totally understood. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry, it's the Fulbright professor. Nothing I said is for the U.S. government either. So nobody yeah. cares, and I don't care either. My, <laughs> my, uh, but we had uh, a visitor last year, li late last year, from the Brookings Institution, a rather senior guy. <coughs> and when we talked with him about the US election in the light of the situation then prevailing, he was absolutely certain that uh, <coughs> Marco Rubio will win the Republican nomination. That was the bet number then, yeah. Yes, but it showed <coughs> then afterwards that uh, <coughs> how unpredictable the situation is and how badly wrong even senior guys can go in their thinking and my <coughs> my nasty feeling if I may <coughs> now is that uh, uh, maybe <coughs> people are now too confident about the chances of Mrs. Clinton against any of the Republican candidates and in particular against Mr. Trump I mean, <clears throat> how certain can we be that there are not inside the, uh, Republic, uh, the Democratic voting base <clears throat> uh, more resentment, <clears throat> resentment against their uh, present uh, prevailing situation than show, shows up in this primary phase? And that Mr. Trump, if he's going to be the candidate standing against uh, Hil uh, Hillary Clinton, cannot mobilize that resentment in his favor in the elections. And that election then could be much more, much more close, even if he, he loses. I, I, I totally get where you're going. My fears here. <laughs> no, I, I totally get where you're going. Um, my, my problem is with, 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 with that analysis, because there's certainly a possibility that there's mobilization, is that Trump comes to the table with staggering amounts of baggage too. Right, so that for all of the resentment that he might mobilize against her, clearly any Democratic candidate is going to be able to mobilize enormous amounts of baggage against him. This is a man who, in an interview with a, uh, back when he had a, his daughter, his daughter Tiffany was like two, had an interview on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, it was a U.S. show back in the 80s, um, was asked about his then wife Marla Maples, understand we've had one president in American history who was divorced. St. Ronald Reagan. Donald Trump's been divorced twice and on wife number three, right? Um, was asked about, about his daughter and about what characteristics the daughter got from him and what characteristics the daughter got from his mo her mother. Mar uh, Marley Maples was her name. Um, and this is the point where anybody who's a parent knows what you're supposed to say. Oh, she's got my chin, she's got my, right, that question. His answer was, He's got Mar she's got Marla's legs, they're beautiful and we're not sure about these yet. Daughter was two. 
This is a man who has openly said that Ivanka Trump was not his daughter, he'd date her. So he comes to the table with a hell of a lot of baggage too. Now if it wasn't Trump and it wasn't Cruz, I'd be more worried. But these people are, sometimes you get lucky and stupid enemies. And what you have to do then, uh, the only thing that matters, and there's a website called 270towin.com and I recommend it highly, you go through state by state by state by state by state and do the math. And you have to show me how New York or Illinois or California or Pennsylvania or those states stop voting Democrat because of Donald Trump. And I can't get there. I just can't. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you know, the universe exists. It turns out I have been wrong before. Please don't tell my wife. She's never seen it. But nonetheless, you know, it's, it's, that's a big one. questions? Yeah, my name is Anders Adagres. I'm a member of parliament and, uh, and I've been, I've had this uh, strange, strange fascination by, for American presidential politics since I was 10 years old. I remember being really upset when Reagan won instead of Anderson, who was my favorite. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, he wasn't going to win, by the way. I no, no. I think I think you can say that that the Republican Party is pretty much now reaping what it's been sowing for the the, yeah. the, few, the past years. I mean, they have been consciously painting a picture of a Kenyan-born Muslim who is taking your guns and your money and your flag and your religion. Uh, you talked about the myth of Reagan. I listened to a to a recording of a of a debate between George Herbert Walker Bush and, and Reagan in 79 or 80, and that was like a really sensible discussion on immigration. Yeah, when, 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 they're deba when they're debating who's going to be nicer on immigration. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, they were really, really compassionate and understanding and, and structured yeah. in many ways. Uh, so t Cruz talks about the party of Reagan and taking the Republican Party back to, 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 to that time, probably not understanding what Reagan really was about. So I, I wonder, do you think that the Republican Party can now implode so badly that it be, will revise its way of making politics and, and, and driving the public discussion? Well, I can tell you what's, what's a not untypical pattern in American life, and we'll talk about the Democratic Party for a few minutes. When I went to graduate school in the late 1980s, they talked about the Republican Electoral College lock. The notion was that, by the, almost the reverse of what exists today, that the Republican that the most states were voting Republican consistently and therefore that the Republicans started every election with massive electoral college advantages and that it manifested itself in Reagan's 1980 victory and then in 1984 my first presidential election the one the first one I got to vote in 1984 um, which was the biggest electoral college wipeout of all time Ronald Reagan won re-election 525 to 13 Walter Mondale won Minnesota and the District of Columbia he was from Minnesota and the District of Columbia is 80% black. That's it, all he won. After that wipeout, after the, the storm and drong of the Carter years, and then again in 88, which was less of a wipeout, but still a bigger wipeout than the Obama years, George Bush won 400 electoral college votes in 1988. Right? The Democratic Party went into a soul-searching mode and created the party that is currently dying. The Clinton-esque New Democratic Party, which was going to be pro-Wall Street and pro-business and anti-crime, it was going to try to steal some of the issues that the Republicans have been pummeling it with, which they also ultimately successfully did. Barack Obama raised more money than Mitt Romney did. Barack Obama, by the way, is the person who shattered the modern American finance system. Barack Obama in, in 2008 shattered the American finance system and turned it into the financial free-for-all that it's been turned into. Not a Republican, Barack Obama. That's the, that's the party that Bernie Sanders is now fighting and Hillary Clinton is kind of the last vestige of a representation of. But it's been really successful. In fact, the Democratic Party has won five of the last six presidential elections in terms of popular vote. Four, in fact, because of Bush v. Gore, that remarkable Supreme Court decision, which said it doesn't count for anybody else. Have a nice day. Once the Supreme Court suddenly decided equal protection, which they had paid no attention to for decades, they suddenly decided equal protection mattered when it mattered for Bush. Um, so it took several getting pummelings, years of debate, the rise of a charismatic young politician named Bill Clinton 
to establish that Democratic Party as the one that then is going to carry forward for the next 20 years, mostly as the dominant presidential party. Right now, the thing about the Republican Party is they're winning in Congress, they're winning at the state level, so they haven't quite bottomed out. Historically, when parties bottom out, since at least the collapse of the Whig Party in the 1850s, they've gone into that soul-searching mode, readapted themselves, reintegrated themselves. I mean, part of the remarkable thing about the myth of Reagan is you'd think it was also 1980 in terms of the military threats the United States faces, as if ISIS is the Soviet Union. Well, hell, Russia's not the Soviet Union. I mean, I know it looks a little scarier from here and with the crap going out in the Baltic out there. <laughs> I get it, right? But, on a, but, but the size of the Russian Navy today is like a 12-minute fight for the United States to destroy the Russian Navy. It's like a 12-minute fight. They've got like 18 workable boats. That's one carrier battle fleet. I've got 11. And I'm buying two more, because what the hell? I got money? Right. Half the world's military spending is spent by the United States, right? Against ISIS. What the hell does the F-22 have to do with ISIS? Not a damn thing, but that's what we're spending our money on. Right? They've frozen into that moment. Um, and that's the great question. Are they going to get kicked in the head often enough to say, hey, I should stop doing that? Or are they going to get kicked in the head often enough that they'll die and a new kind of coalition will emerge? Um, so far, they've always managed to adapt. But again, so far they haven't nominated Donald Trump, so there we go. <laughs> Unfortunately, my, 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 my powers of prediction, if they were better, I'd be richer than I am. <laughs> we'll take one last question from the floor. Over there. Hi, um, my name is Anna Chang. I'm a political science student. Sorry, is it, is it not on? Okay, there we go. Um, Okay. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm Emma Cheng. I'm a political science student at the University of Helsinki. Um, whether uh, whoever will win, um, my worry has been um, Trump's support. It's extremely big, uh, whether he gets the delegates or anywhere. But isn't it still quite worrisome that a huge amount of Americans must be some kind of upset towards the Congress or the system and everything? Um, I don't know. This has uh, always been my question that I think his voters or his supporters are the more fearsome than Trump himself. So, sure. Um, let's let's start from at least one premise. I don't think that you can actually say his support's that big. He's winning 35 to 50 percent of a population of voters that's between eight and 25 percent of an already conservative group. Right. So he's winning a fragmentary fraction of one wing of one part of America. If you think about it just in terms of numbers, right, 10% of America is 31.5 million people, 32 million people. 10% isn't that big. It's still 32 million people, right? And so I think that what's happened is because they make good television, because they do in fact drive ratings, because Trump has been willing to go further than most candidates are willing to go, and indeed Marco Rubio did raise this very point, say this is dangerous to mobilize this kind of anger because you don't know that you can restrain it. Um, it has the potential to be quite outsized. That said, we're six months into one cycle. The genius of the American system of checks and balances is you've got to go multiple cycles before you can take the system. You've got to go multiple cycles of elections and sustain that in order to get control of the House, get control of the Senate, get control of the presidency, get control of the courts, get control of it. And so normally things peter out, things soften. There are exceptions. There are the great social movements that continue. Again, as we're in the middle of it, it's hard to say. I am at current reluctant to say that this constitutes some kind of paradigm shift. We're having an eruptive moment that's based on real contradictions that actually exist within the Republican Party. Um, the, if, in fact, either the Republicans or the Democrats can figure out a way to actually start serving that constituency instead of lip serving that constituency, it seems to be that much of the tensions will erode. 
They may not. And that's why the one great thing as a political scientist you understand, as I, as I tell my students all the time, political science is a terrible thing to be interested in if you like good answers. <laughs> it's an amazing thing to be interested in if you like good questions. And that, alas, is what I have to leave you with, is good questions, because I don't have good answers. <laughs> Thank you.